Hello and welcome to the Econ Buff Podcast. I'm your host, Lise Titzel. With me today is Dr. Robert P. Murphy. He is a senior fellow at the Mises Institute. Oh, I'm sorry. You said uh, Mises. Mises. I get that right? No, Mises. Mises. It's like, like Reese's Pieces. Mises. Thank you. Uh, he is the author of many books. His latest is Contra Krugman, Smashing the Errors of America's Most Famous Keynesian. His other works include Chaos Theory, Lessons for the Young Economist, and Choice, Cooperation, Enterprise, and Human Action, which is a modern distillation of the essentials of uh, Mises thought <laughs> for the layperson. He's also host of The Bob Murphy Show. Bob, welcome. Thanks for having me, Lee. Glad to be here. So I'm uh, honored to have you on. And uh, the reason that, that I asked you to come on is to talk about business cycles and what causes them. So I find that when I teach a principles macro class, a lot of textbooks, the treatment of this is sort of like business cycles happen. And here's a really stylized graph of sort of ups and downs here. Um, so it's one of those things that I would really love to fill in for mm -hmm. the economic education of a lot of people. Um, you're going to be bringing an interesting perspective, uh, but just start us out with telling us what business cycles are. Sure. So you're right. In terms of you ask professional economists and what they mean, um, like the, the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research, they're the ones in the U.S. that are officially in charge of documenting when business cycles, you know, the expansion and the contractions begin, and you can go and look up the dates. And typically, they're, it's not a hard and fast rule, but they say if real GDP growth is negative for two quarters in a row, mm -hmm. that's when they say, oh, we're in recession. Right. But, for the, but for the layperson, you know, first of all, that's like a very technical thing. I think what the average person, you know, what, what they mean by what, what's the business cycle is there's periods when it seems like the economy is doing well and workers wages are rising. And if you don't like your job, you can quit. And there's lots of opportunities elsewhere. And then for some reason, it seems like there's these periods where everything is just kind of bad and businesses are laying off workers and the unemployment rate goes way up. And so that's not just in people's heads. Like there really is this cyclical rhythmic flow in market economies that has been around at least since the 1800s, where it just does seem like it's not just you know, economic growth continues over longer stretches, but it does seem like it's not just smooth and steady uptrend that there's these cycles where there's periods where there's above average growth and then it, it falls and then there's above average growth and then it falls. And so the, the question is, why does that keep happening? You know, why is, are there these cyclical ups and downs? So I always kind of make the point, there's a, there's a trend in modern mm -hmm. economies, right? But there's this, that general growth, there's deviation sort of above and below it over time. A lot of times I'll show them a picture of, of the type of um, graphs from like the St. Louis uh, Fred that show this kind of jagged um, picture of ups mm -hmm. and downs, you know, and usually the sharp falls and then sort of longer periods of growth. Um, but you always end up teaching kind of out of a stylized, you know, nice smooth curves of up and down. Um, so what I guess what we're here to ask today is what is it that causes that? And I kind of want to start out because um, I want to take an approach to get the several different ideas out there. Um, so what's the current mainstream story about what causes business cycles? Well, I don't know that there's actually one. So I'll give mm -hmm. two, two uh, different theories that are attributable to, you know, con economists that are, would be considered in the mainstream. Um, so there's the Chicago, it, it's associated with the Chicago school, but it's beyond that. And it's called real business cycle theory or mm -hmm. RBC for short. So these are people that they think markets clear, you know, people are generally rational. And whenever you try to like, you see some anomaly or a, apparent anomaly, you just try to explain it through rational, like, oh, once you realize what people are doing and it all makes sense. And so the, the reason that it's called real business cycle theory is they're saying there are shocks to the real economy. And so real in this context means not monetary. Mm -hmm. And so they're, um, you know, they'll just say that for whatever reasons, this, the system was in a nice equilibrium and then there was some unexpected shock. And then the way the system responds to that, it's optimal or rational for a certain part of the labor force to just, uh, you know, pull back for a while until the economy re retools. And, um, and so the, the, it's very elegant and you can draw up nice, sophisticated models 
where all the people in the model know what's going on and they use calculus and they optimize and it, it is quote a rational response in certain periods for 10% of the labor force to just you know enjoy and consume their leisure because their product productivity at that moment while the economy is while stuff's getting moved around it, you know it doesn't justify them going into work and so the the problem and and also if people are trying to like well, how could that be rational because it throws in realistic things like workers and firms need to find each other right there's search costs right so once you start putting making your model more realistic about how the real world is it can make sense you know in a certain setting that oh yeah we, we, we didn't know what was coming we, we thought labor was going to be more productive than it is or we thought you know farmland was going to be more productive or what hey or there's this innovation from china that we weren't expecting and given the way we sort of locked ourselves in this thing took us by surprise and then while we re-equilibrate there are pocket periods where certain things you know need to and what a quick one and then i'll move on to a different example of a, of a mainstream explanation lee um you could imagine how like if if a hardware store thought some product was going to take off and they ordered a bunch of it and it was sitting on the shelves and it was overflowing in the stock room and then the customers just turned out they didn't like it you know they thought it was gonna be the hot new thing this christmas season mm -hmm. And it turned out kids didn't like it because the noise was a bit too loud or something. And then you can imagine the store having this overhang and they're reluctant to slash, slash prices. And so they leave the prices up for a little bit just to see, oh, doesn't anybody want these? And we'll, let's wait till after Christmas and we'll cut it 10%. And then finally they slash prices just to get rid of it. Ah, we screwed up. And so there would be a period where like the product would be just sitting on the shelves and nobody would be buying it as the stores like experimented. So that's kind of like what the late happens to the labor market. Mm -hmm. In, in a recession in these models where yet yeah, people didn't quite forecast correctly. And then, you know, it, they're reluctant to just cut wages right away to the market, you know, to the thing that would clear supply and demand the quantities. And so there's a brief overhang, you know, workers are like hoping, wait, can I get a job? What if I'm willing to move? Wait, wait, let me stay unemployed while I keep looking. And finally, ah, I cut my wage demands and I go and take a job somewhere and then right. unemployment. So that's kind of the model there. So the, um, the, the more Keynesian approach of people who don't think markets are always quote rational and that things can get screwed up for long periods of time. And then they also think the government, by, by the way, so for that last theory, if that's basically true, there's nothing for the government to do right. because the government can't let people forecast better. And once it is what it is, you just got to let it ride it out. The, the Keynesians in contrast, uh, or those just more broadly who believe it's a demand side problem not just like a supply side shock to the system, you know, real factor. They would say that it could be from various things. It could be because monetary policy is poor or just there's some kind of shock. And then, and then they're, but what they're saying, the specific causes, it's not something on the real side. It's not physical or technological, like, oh, farmland is less productive than we thought or something like that. It's consumers got spooked. They're not spending like we thought they would. Mm -hmm. And then that's what causes the system to seize up. And so in that framework um, where there's just inadequate demand, again, you had the same uh, 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 impact on the macro variables. All of a sudden businesses aren't selling as much. They lay off workers and everything, but there, if that's what the ultimate cause is, the fix is real easy. Just, oh, just have the government come in and run a budget deficit. And then that will, you know, replace the spending that the private sector is seizing up on. And then you can restore employment that way. So, um, so those are two of the main competing right. narratives right now, I would say, in terms of economists who are not Austrians, not Misesians, and, you know, from big top 10 schools. I, uh, I was actually introduced to real business cycle theory on the way through my undergraduate education. Um, and so when I asked what, what's the current mainstream story, I get just... I kind of always think mainstream equals Keynesian. So, you know, that consumer mm -hmm. confidence story, I think is what people see on the news. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of, that was kind of my thought process there, but um, let's go back to the real business cycle theory uh, for a moment there. Um, you, you said a couple of things that I thought were interesting. One is, you know, the shocks that are coming to the system are sort of from outside the system, economists call that exogenous shock, right? And mm -hmm. so there's not much the government can do. Of course, I would also interject at that point and say, except not to make policies that are unexpected for people and therefore cause their own kind right, of shock, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, so can you comment a little bit on that? Because you mentioned some examples of like what might 
um, cause what might cause the shocks. And it is that classic market idea of things will um, equilibrate and this and um, how would you uh, integrate some of these ideas about the labor market? I think people think of the labor market as unique, as different from some of some of the other markets. Like we don't really mind cutting the prices on um, I, the example that you gave children's toys or something like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, but there are quite a few economic theories out there that say there are reasons that we're much more hesitant to cut um, wages. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. If you don't mind, let me just real quickly say what I think the, the big problem with the RBC approach is just so we don't get lost in the shuffle and then yeah, I'll, I'll answer your question. So to me, the, it, it works. It's internally consistent. It's very elegant mathematically, conceptually. It's great. And, and it grew out of the, um, we're getting a little technical, but I, I, I gather your podcast gets into some technical stuff for your yes. listeners. The, um, the, the Lucas critique, like the rational expectations critique of old school Keynesian analysis, where in the Cain, old, like the Keynesian miles, like the 50s and 60s and 70s, they kind of assumed workers were stupid. And like, oh, the union got me a big wage hike, so now I'm going to work more, even though prices are rising too. Like, right. so the Lucas said, no, no, really, for your ex, you know, a, a good theory should have everybody in the model know how the world works. And so that's the, with these RBC models that kind of developed in like the, I think like the late seventies and eighties when they really got pinned down survives that critique, right? In other words, they, they live up to their own thing. It's so it's a, it's a neat little internally consistent story. It's like, if you're watching some sci-fi movie and there's no obvious plot holes, even though their physics is different so like that, right. but still the, so the, the reason I, I think it just doesn't fit the facts well. And so I think this is one where the Keynesians, I think have a good put down is they say in the real business cycle approach in the 1930s, the reason unemployment went up to 25% was because workers just rationally said, no, nope, given the situation, I would rather consume more leisure than I did in the 20s. And so they call it, they say, oh, so for the real business cycle people, it's not the Great Depression, it's the Great Vacation, mm -hmm. which just doesn't seem to, you know, that doesn't ring true. It's like, no, workers were desperate to find work and nobody was willing to hire, you know. So to me, I, I do agree with that, Keynes. And also, to come up with what was the shock, you know, it wasn't like there was, you know, to, to, to rain. Yeah. There was like the dust bowl and stuff, but that doesn't explain why the economy was on the ropes for a decade. Mm -hmm. um, and then like in the eighties or the housing bubble, it's not clear. There wasn't some innovation in building houses that all of a sudden threw everything off. Right. So even like I say, you can do these little internally consistent models that are elegant to me, they don't explain in the real world. Why did this happen? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, to answer your question. Yes, there are, people who argue that labor, the labor market is, is different and that wages are what they say are sticky downward. Meaning if, if firms want to, you know, in, in a boom period, workers are very fluid. They're moving back and forth because yeah, as the firm expands, it's profitable. It can bid workers away from their existing jobs by offering them raises. And that's, you know, workers are quite happy to switch jobs if they're getting a pay hike. The problem is if all of a sudden it's a downtime, down period, and a bunch of businesses realize we can't continue to pay workers what we were paying them last year, or at least to carry this many workers. And so we either got to lay people off or reduce wages. So that's kind of the, 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 the puzzle is why does unemployment go up so much during recessions? If, if, if business is just not as profitable, why don't they just reduce how much they're paying their workers? And then they cut their costs and, and they keep things even. And so, yeah, workers get paid less, but then unemployment doesn't go up. Mm -hmm. And so there's some theories as to why that is. Um, one being that, you know, it would hurt morale, right? Like you, you'd rather, you know, if, if the firm's carrying 100 workers and they, they're unprofitable at that amount, why don't you just lay off the, the least productive five workers, right? And any given thing, you know, you can tell, yeah, that guy Jim down there, he's always on the coffee machine, you know, he's, he's a pain in the butt. And so rather than cut everybody's pay 10%, just get rid of the worst five people and ask the other 95 to do a little more until things improve. And that, yeah, people will might feel bad for a bit, but they'll forget about those five people a month later and go back to work. Whereas if everybody's pay gets cut, they're all going to be grumbling for the next year. And that's just not good. So there's that kind of a theory, things like that to explain, but you know, what, what is clear cut is that firms in that situation nowadays tend to lay off workers and not just cut wages across the board. And so 
so that has implications, like you say, Lee, that, you know, why other things like, oh, commodities and stuff, if people are carrying soybeans or pork bellies and blah, 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 oil, crude oil, prices move pretty rapidly in response to new news, whereas the labor market, that doesn't happen. And one reason, too, is workers sign long-term contracts, like, for their mortgage payments, assuming their salary or wage rates are such and such. And so workers would be reluctant to take a job where the employer could renegotiate their hourly pay every week, right? Why would you, why would you take a job like that? Um, some jobs are like that, they're like piece rate and yeah. stuff, but in general, workers feel much better locking in so they can have some, some certainty, at least for the near term. So that's why then when these shocks happen, whether they're from the demand or supply side, depending on what school of thought you come from, that yeah, the, what seems to happen, the way the immediate adjustment occurs is by laying off workers rather than just cutting wage rates. So the, the last thing I'll mention that is, is lead, this, is mo- this isn't so much a feature of capitalism, this is more of a, a recent thing. So in the work I did on the Great Depression, that was one of the explanations about how awful the gold standard was and things because in the 30s, once prices fell, like the stuff businesses could sell for, oh, well, you can't cut workers' wages and so unemployment went up 25%. In the depression of 1920 and 21, which a lot of people don't even know is a thing, but the, you know that is a thing, wages fell much faster in a 12-month period than they had at any point in the 30s. Okay, and so there was something institutional that changed from the early 20s to the early 30s mm-hmm. that to help explain why wages all of a sudden became sticky downward. They didn't, didn't used to be as sticky, and so even though that does seem to be a thing nowadays, I'm saying it's not just a feature of capitalism. I think it has to do with like unions and government policies and now workers know, oh, there's unemployment benefit. You know what I mean? So there's lots of changes that occurred and you can even see it in just the passage of 10 years historically that wages all of a sudden became a lot more rigid. Um, and so it's not a feature of capitalism per se. I, I hadn't heard that. So that's very interesting. Um, so what I'd like to do now, do, do you want to mention a, a critique that you would make of the Keynesian and then that kind of set us up for introducing Austrian business cycle theory and uh, the explanation sure. that you would favor for what would cause business cycles? Sure. So my, I guess probably my big problem with the Keynesian uh, approach is they, they're really just treating the symptoms. They don't step back and say, why is it all of a sudden that you have these big you know, collapses in, in demand? And then also, and and the reason that's important is, as we're about to get into, presumably, if you know what the Austrian theory is as to what causes the business cycle, if the Austrians are correct, or at least if that's part of the story, you know, maybe there's other stuff going on too, but if they put their finger on one important contribute, contributing factor, then what the Keynesians recommended solution is, is actually the thing that keeps setting up these recurring boom bust cycles. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's actually the, the, it's not just that the Keynesians aren't helping. It's that what they're recommending is actually the thing that causes the, 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 you know, the next wave of this stuff. And so that's, to me, the, and also, too, um, the, the Keynesian approach, it's very um, macro in the sense, like, it's, it's just looking at big picture numbers, like total spending and things like that. It's not looking at more um, granular micro phenomenon or phenomena that's the plural um of like if if mistakes were made and certain investments went in particular lines and they shouldn't have then that's a real thing and just to have more spending is not necessarily going to fit that and the last thing i'll mention too is even on its own terms like the keynesian idea is oh we can have the government so, so normally what they'll say is like something like paul krugman will admit that oh yeah in general in a healthy economy, if the government runs a budget deficit to spend money on bridges or something, there's an opportunity cost that real resources, including labor hours, go into producing the bridge where the politicians point to. Mm -hmm. And those resources, including labor hours, could have been allocated elsewhere. So we shouldn't just look at the bridge or the stadium or whatever and say, oh, that's brand new wealth that we got for free. You have to contrast it with, well, what don't we have now? Because those resources went to there. And typically you would expect the market economy to allocate resources to where consumers want better than the political process. So that makes us poor. So the Keynesians say, you're, you're right, that's true in general, but not during a bad recession, particularly what they would call a liquidity trap. Right. And they say there it's, it's free that when the government runs a deficit, 
it's taking idle resources, including workers who are sitting around watching the view and not doing anything productive, and they go back to work now. And so there's no opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a bit too glib because in general, it's, you know, it's never going to be that even the majority, you know, there's some bridge being built. If you went and surveyed all the workers and stuff and all the research, it's not that literally every resource that goes into that bridge was previously totally unemployed right. and would have been unemployed forever. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if they had stepped back, you know, things would have gone back to normal. And so at best it's, you're mobilizing these resources earlier than would have happened under the market process. And so if you think there is a sense in which during a recession, things really are getting retooled to be more efficiently or sustainably deployed, the, the Keynesian alleged solution interrupts that. Okay. And, so, and so you could argue there's a trade-off between relief and long-run sustainability, but even on its own terms, I think when you push it, it it's clear that um, it's, it's almost like a knife edge case, like, like what they're having to argue, whereas when they talk about it to the public and explain what they're doing glibly, I think they way oversell or way under acknowledge the, the harms of what they're doing. So the... Uh... I like the way that you put this because one of the things that I would say about real business cycle theory is um, the recession is a way to um, fix some of the misallocations that have happened in the economy, right? It's resetting that resource allocation. That's kind of the paradigm that I think about macro uh, through a lot, of, a lot of the time. So having set both of those up, I think we're now really nicely set up for you to mm -hmm. kind of lay out for us what your preferred explanation for business cycle theory is sure thing and what's what's interesting about the austrian approach is to me it takes what's true from both camps mm -hmm. and and, it, and it's not that the austrian sat back and it was sort of a hegelian you know thesis antithesis synthesis thing it, it, this the, the Misesian. so I'm, it's ludwig von mises that one of the giants in the austrian school developed this originally in 1912 and then he elaborated and his follower Friedrich Hayek continued his work and then ultimately won the Nobel Prize in 74 largely for his work on business cycle um, work so this was developed before the Keynes you know the, the Keynes's famous thing came out in the 30s mm -hmm. in real business cycle like I said really wasn't until the late 70s 80s but it's interesting that it sort of anti it, it anticipates the, the Misesian theory the elements of truth in both camps. So in the Austrian story, there's both real factors going on, but also demand side or monetary ones too. Um, and so I, I'm gonna not get the exact phrasing right, but Fritz Machlup said something like in the Austrian approach, the business cycle has real effects that are driven by monetary causes or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, and so that's why you know, the two school, the, what the, the problems I identified for you, Lee, earlier in the RBC and the Keynesian camp, I think the Austrian overcomes both of them. So in the Austrian vision, what you need to realize is the market economy tends to work well, prices help allocate, you know, resources. They're not perfect, but that's the best, you know, human institution there can be. And certainly having politicians come in and second guess speculators who have their own money on the line, you know, skin in the game, to say, oh no, resources should go here or here. That's that's goofy. Why would you think the political process, those people would have any more wisdom than you know the experts with their own money on the line? And in particular, one of the prices that's very important is the interest rate. Mm -hmm. Or in practice, there's multiple interest rates, but just you know, for our purposes here, just think of it as the interest rate. And in the Austrian view, that helps allocate resources over time. And so in particular, if the people in a society are very patient and they're willing to defer consumption, so they save a lot of their income, that tends to push down interest rates. And so the businesses see a low interest rate and they realize, oh, I can borrow funds that are like a low penalty, as it were, and invest in longer projects so long as you know they're going to yield something down the road. And so that's the way you know the interest rate helps coordinate the use of resources into steering them into things that the consumers want. Whereas if the society is very impatient and, and the consumers kind of want, you know, immediate gratification, they don't save much of their income. And so then how do market prices adjust? Well, the interest rate tends to be high, right? Cause like there's not many loanable funds available. And so then 
businesses know, oh, if you're going to tie up resources for a long time, it better be in a really productive thing because you're having that high interest rate dinging you over time until you can, you know, sell the product for the revenue and pay off the loan. Right. And so that's obviously I'm, I'm speaking loosely here, Lee, but that's, that's the idea that interest rates serve a function in a market economy, just like a high price of oil means something and you need to pay attention to it. And it would be bad if the politicians somehow masked that and made people buy gasoline as if oil were $20 a barrel when really it was $200 a barrel. You wouldn't be doing anybody any favors by, by hiding those signals that the prices are giving people. So likewise, if the interest rate's supposed to be 8% and somehow the political process pushes it down to 2%, that's going to screw things up. You're not, you're not helping people by having low interest rates that stimulate spending. Right. And so then when, when the Austrians get more particular and specific about, well, what does it screw up if the interest rates artificially low, it in a sense gives the wrong signal to entrepreneurs that, oh, it's okay to tie up resources in long-term projects because the penalty you know, per year of this stuff rolling over is low. Mm -hmm. And so it gives us false green light. So entrepreneurs start these long projects that might have been justified in an alternate universe where there was more savings and the interest rate really should have been low but not in the current universe when the interest rate is supposed to be higher, but yet it was pushed down because of the central bank, let's say. So that's, so that in the Austrian story, then the, the boom period is the problem, right? So it's the boom bust cycle. It's not just, oh, recessions happen. It's for every recession in the Austrian view, there's a prior artificial boom where mistakes were made, where male investments were made and businesses invested in things that they shouldn't have. They were giddy. They were opt overly optimistic. And then that ultimately leads to a bust. And so that's the Austrian story. And so in the recession period, even though it's painful, I got wasp flying around here. That's why I'm <laughs> In the recession period, um, even though it's painful, ironically, that's almost like the cleansing period where the economy shakes off those male investments. And that's why certain resources, including labor hours, temporarily, some of them are unemployed because the economy, I'm speaking loosely here, collectively realizes, oh, wait a minute, what we were doing was unsustainable during right. that boom period. We were investing in longer term projects than the people were willing to save and fund. And so we were going to hit a wall physically. This could not have continued. This is literally impossible to, to keep up the pace of what we were do, doing. And it's better to acknowledge the error sooner rather than later. And then once you do what you do, you, you stop. If, yeah. if, if to say the economy as a whole was on an unsustainable trajectory means there were some workers every day getting up and going into work that were going to the wrong places. And so in a market decentralized economy where there's not a dictator who just orders people around, how do you coax people to stop going to the wrong factory every day is they have to get laid off. And that's painful for the worker but that's in a decentralized system where everybody chooses their own employment. That's the way the system gives that feedback. And then, and so then they got to search. And the reason it's painful is because we were not as rich as we thought we were, the new jobs, those people take the ones who had been going to the wrong places of work during the unsustainable boom, their job, at least for a while is not going to be as lucrative, right? Cause we were poorer than we thought. And so nobody wants, you know, like I say, it's easy to get bid away to go to a better job. It's tough to get laid off and then realize I got to take a job that's not paying as much or that's not as fun or whatever. And so that's why there's this overhang of workers who search to say, is there something better? And then, yeah, unemployment benefits can extend that. So that's the, the, the gist of the Austrian story. So what, what they say is during a recession, the worst thing to do is for the central bank to slash interest rates and pump in cheap credit to try to you know boost spending especially investment spending because that's what sets up you know sows the seeds yeah. for the next boom bust cycle so you're just you're causing the very thing that you think you're helping and so like i said that's why if the austrians are right or at least that's part of the story the keynesian solution which entails slashing interest rates and then if that still isn't enough having the government deficit spend that's the worst thing to do i have my students in my graduate classes read uh, arnold kling's not what they had in mind and one of his principal points in there is to say, every time we have a recession, the policy responses sow the seeds for the next crisis right. as akin to what you're saying, but you're saying it's really just the general response that the Federal Reserve is taking. Um, so yeah, if I could, so all of Arnold's stuff on like 
what do you call it, like a recalculation story or something mm-hmm. like that? Yeah, I agree with everything he said. It's just I think the Austrian story gives more explanation as to why did we find ourselves in this situation where recalculation was necessary. Right. So, yeah, that's a good point, because I think uh, Kling's story is to say we just have bad policy responses to these. It's not even necessarily giving a uh, the type of explanation that you're giving for each each sort of bust. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually caused by resources being misallocated because interest rates are are a price. And mm-hmm. you, so you have price distortion that's that's causing um, people to make choices that don't actually reflect. And now you frame this specifically in the preferences of um, of the individuals that are in the economy. Is that right? Or is there more to that? So, I don't know if this is answering your question. So what is true is what people's subjective preferences over, um, you know, how much do I, of my income do I want to consume now versus deferring for the future? Yep. You know, that, that's a subjective thing. Just like if the, if you look at one society and people really like to smoke cigarettes, well, then it would make sense for more farmland to be devoted to tobacco. Yep. Whereas in a place where everyone doesn't like cigarettes, then none of the farmland should be devoted to tobacco. So likewise, looking at economy, it might be correct for most of the productive resources every year to go into building more factories and 18 wheelers and drill presses as opposed to movie theaters and milkshakes and, you know, uh, designer jeans. Mm -hmm. So that's just a matter of subjective taste as to what the consumers want. The problem occurs when it's people who want the milkshakes and movie theaters and, and jeans. And yet, because the central bank pushes down interest rates, the entrepreneurs who are building long-term factories and drill presses and things, they're able to start plants and hire workers right. because they think, oh, we have enough savings to justify this when we really don't. So the the reason that I like the combination of what you've set up there and this idea of prices is um, one of the first places that I came across Austrian business cycle was actually brought up by Tyler Cowen in a critical way. And his mm-hmm. argument is, even if there's easy um, money out there and interest rates are wrong, that doesn't mean that doesn't necessarily mean you have malinvestment. Um, this is his analogy to just because bananas are very uh, common, you don't have to put them on your roof. That strikes me as um, as a not particularly good argument in the sense that in almost any other situation, I would imagine an economist like Cowan and probably us as well would say. But prices, when they're distorted in every other market, we would say that is going to cause um, some kind of problem, whether it's misallocation or just um, a mix of goods and services that don't match what people want, which is why you bringing up the preferences I thought was so important. Um, Would you like to comment on on those type of, I hesitate to even call them critiques of, of what you've laid out? Yeah, so it, you know, it's a good, th- that's, I think, the single strongest objection to Austrian business cycle theory. So people might call it the, the rational expectations objection. And so, yeah, the, the, I, this, the, the complaint goes just to flesh it out a little bit, says, okay, according to Mises and Murray Rothbard, and you know, now this guy, Bob Murphy, who's just parroting what they say, it's like, oh, businesses are just chugging along. And then the Fed comes and cuts interest rates and businesses say, oh, look at interest rates are lower. It's because people save more and there must be more, you know, tractors available and things like that. And more uh, uh, pro programmers who have, who know all kinds of software skills. And so I'll go ahead and start building this 10 year factory. And then oops, when the fed tightens two years down the road, because CPI starts getting a little hot, those factory owners slap their heads and say, Oh, wow, I didn't see this coming. I didn't know that the interest rates could rise. Now I'm dead and I got to lay everybody off. And so the critique is, Sure, maybe back in the 1920s, they didn't know this, but by this point, you got Fed watchers, everybody's watching M1, M2, da, 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 da. they're reading Fed minutes, they know what the Fed's objectives are in terms of, you know, unemployment and inflation, and so they have, you have long-term futures markets and interest rates and things, you know, bonds, what have you, treasuries, so how can it be that the business people just keep getting surprised by what the Fed does, don't they take this into account, so if interest rates really are artificially low, don't the businesses all know that and don't they, you know, be, act appropriately and not. So, yeah, so that there's a, certainly an element there. Um, I think part of the problem is just 
the the standard way Austrians tell the story glibly, yeah, you could you could fix it up a little bit, and it's not that businesses are just like, oh wow, I had no idea. Like you say, Lee, everybody agrees that in this conversation that outright central planning doesn't work. That market prices serve a function in general. You wouldn't just say, oh well, why isn't the socialist planner just you know if everybody knows where shirts are supposed to go, what do we need prices for? Yeah. You know, what, what are, are all of a sudden the shirt distributors stupid and they don't they think that nobody needs shirts or they right. think everyone needs 16 T-shirts at once? No, they don't. Uh, you wouldn't talk like that. You would say, yeah, but there's a lot of specifics and you do need exact market prices to help decide on the margin. You know, does this town need more shirts or not? You know, that kind of stuff. And so likewise, yes, if the Fed pushes interest rates down from 7 percent to 1 percent, we can all know that that 1 percent is artificially low. But we don't know how low it is. We don't. We we can't just be central planners and say, oh, in the absence of Fed action, here's what the interest rate really would have been, because then that you know then socialism would work if we could talk like that. You need right. actual market prices to guide things. The other thing too with with this is during like like let's take like a real example like during the housing bubble mania, there were plenty of uh, you know financial institutions that were sort of on the sidelines saying, yeah, these mortgage-backed securities, I don't understand how these things work. This is crazy. We're not getting involved. And their competitors made a bunch of money on the way up. And there were also, um, I talked to a, like a, the guy who built my house in Nashville. Um, I had you know, talked to him and he was, so this was in like 2006 or seven, I think. And he was looking around at the, the mania and he was like pointing at developments down the street. And he's like, yeah, the guy's doing that, you know, building that house down there. They're like all in their young twenties. Like, like they, they've just been in this business for like a year. And so he was older and he had reduced his inventory. You know, he was just doing houses on spec and then moving on. He was not working on 10 houses at once because he knew a crash was coming. He didn't want to get caught carrying a big inventory. Whereas these people, like those kids building the house down the street, like they couldn't even finish it. Like once everything crashed. Yeah. So the, my point being, when if the banks are handing out cheap money, it could be that the seasoned people know not to take it, but you can't stop other people from coming in who, who have no wisdom from just go ahead and borrow at the cheap rates. And so capital still, like real physical capital goods, in this case, you know, lumber and shingles and everything and, you know, worker hours do get allocated into projects where they shouldn't because the chief regulator is prices, right? In a market economy, the thing that the break on silly investments is a high interest rate or the banks having good credit standards. And so if those things get battered down for various reasons, then there's going to be male investments. And why doesn't the normal like Kayaki and the role of prices and the inf solving the information problem, that seems to work perfectly well in interest rates and messing with those prices seems just as bad as anywhere else. I mean, this, this is why I had you on in order to talk mm -hmm. about this kind of thing. Um, it, it just strikes me as, um, I want to say straightforward, but like this is this is a thing that free market economists would all would all point to. So, um, and I, I think that's where Austrian business cycle theory has has a lot of appeal. So we're we're coming up on our on our time limit here, and I, and I don't want to keep you over, but uh, I know what my listeners are going to ask. I said, okay, Dr. Murphy, he comes along and he lays out this great theory and these excellent critiques, and okay, we we buy it. We're we're all Austrian business cycle theory um, now they're going to want sort of a policy prescription. So can you lay that picture for us out to sort of, to sort of play out this episode? Sure. So it's, um, unfortunately, if the Austrians are right, there's no way once there's a bad bust underway, there's no way to, you know, automatically just make it end. Right. Because the problem is, like I say, that male investments were made, workers were going to the wrong jobs and so the only way to fix that is some of them need to, to switch over. So, um, and certainly what you don't want to do is push down interest rates or have stimulus spending things to, to make it so that the places that are laying off workers change their mind. If, if, we're, if what it is, is workers were going to the wrong spot, if that was unsustainable, you don't want to let the illusion persist to try to avoid the short-term pain. So, um, so clearly what you don't want to do is sow the seeds for the next boom bust cycle. So you certainly don't want the central bank engaging in easy money policies. Now you could take steps like the federal government or, you know, state and local, they could do things to try to ease the pain, but not, not retard 
the process of reshuffling workers. So for example, if you want to provide relief payments, then go ahead and do that. But don't, don't make it that, oh, if you're unemployed, then you get more checks. Just do a flat, you know, give people, um, <clears throat> if they got laid off, you know, give them a flat payment just for the next six months, we'll give you such and such as a percentage of your previous salary or something like that, whether or not you take a job. So that, you know, that would slow the process somewhat, but at least if someone goes and finds a new job, they can, you know, they're not going to have their unemployment run out. So you could do little tweaks like that to try to split the difference where you're providing some relief for people um, that, you know, happen to be bearing the brunt of this readjustment, but yet you're not slowing the, the incentives to switch over to get to a more sustainable trajectory. So ultimately, the, the only long-term solution is to take, and I know this is radical, but you're asking them, this is the only re, you know, real fix, is to put money in banking back in the private sector, right? Like if we just, if, if there was a committee in charge of setting oil, crude oil prices, and they met every once in a while and then had, you know, the federal open crude oil committees announcements on here's our target for the price of crude for the next three months. We're watching situation in the Middle East and that, 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 and we want the price of crude to be between 98 and $107 a barrel. And we're going to adjust. That would be crazy. Everyone would say, well, you know, your central planning, what are you doing? And yet that's what we do with interest rates mm -hmm. and, and money. And, and even lots of free market economists think that's totally fine. And so I'm saying there, there's no right way to centrally plan the economy whether you're talking about crude oil prices or cars or interest rates. And so it's not that I'm giving, you know, there's different proposals for here's what the Fed ought to do. And I'm saying, no, the only real solution is to get rid of the Fed altogether and just have interest rates be set in a decentralized market process the way other prices are. My guest today has been Bob Murphy. Bob, thanks for joining us on the Econ Buff. Thanks for having me, Lee. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of the EconBuff. You can find all previous episodes on YouTube at EconBuff Podcast. You can check out our website at econbuffpodcast.wixsite.com. That's W-I-X-S-I-T dot com. You can contact us at econbuffpodcast at yahoo.com.